So you all have probably realized by now that I don't typically do intros. I don't typically come up and say something. We normally just get right into the lesson, but uh, Macy and I have really enjoyed getting to know everybody here. I can honestly say that you all are all a hoot. Um, you guys are, are a lot, a lot of fun to be around, and um, you're good people, and I can tell that. Um, I really appreciate the love that has been shown to the Garrett family this week. Um, I know that this has been a, a tough time for them and for, for you all as well. Um, I think I've heard, I've heard the, the brother mention in just about every prayer that's been offered thus far, and that, that shows a connectivity that's there. Um, it shows a healthiness of the group that's there as well. And so just kudos to, to all of you all for that. Um, we are talking about healthy churches this week, and we're going we're gonna to wrap up our series today. We talked on Sunday about how James Church, the audience that James is speaking to, they are an unhealthy church, right? We are all looking to be a healthy church. They are an unhealthy church. And one of the reasons how uh, we can tell that they're unhealthy is that there's a lot of conflict there, right? There's a lot of strife. There's wars and fights that are going on. Now, James, he does not specify exactly what this fighting might be about. Um, it could be about doctrine. It could be about something else, right? He doesn't specify what the fighting is about. But I think even now, I think if we knew that a congregation always had internal beef, if there was always problems and conflicts, we would say something's wrong there, right? This, this should not be this way. And so if you'll open up your Bibles to James chapter 4, James chapter 4, um, James actually, he opens up the chapter by asking them about the conflicts, about all the problems that they're having. Um, he really just kind of says, hey, what's, what's going on there? What's, what's happening? Um, it, he says, why, why, are you, why do you think you're having this conflict? To me, it sounds like it's almost, he's almost like a mediator or maybe a, a therapist where it's like, hey, uh, sit on the couch and hey, what's, what's going on? Tell me, tell me your side of things. And so he opens up in, in James chapter 4, he says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Why are you having these problems? Now, I think, I think had the audience been allowed to answer this question, there probably would have been a lot of finger pointing, right? Because that's, that's what we do. Whenever there's problems, we're always like, okay, it's, it's what this guy is doing. They may have been like, James, you know how Bartholomew is. You know how he, how he gets. You know he doesn't know how to act. That, it's, it's his fault. He's the reason why we're having, having these problems. Um, this is what they did. That's, that's what people do. They, we always try to blame other people whenever there's conflict. Um, it's almost like, like when you're asking children why they're fighting. right? If you have two kids who just got finished tussling, you, you'll bring them aside and say, hey, what happened? Well, usually they're like, well, let me tell you what they did. right? There's usually a little bit of embellishing that happens. When you hear the story, you're like, okay, that may have happened, but it probably didn't happen in that exact way, right? There's almost no, no part of the conversation points back to them. They don't ever tell you what they did, right? And so kids are funny, but I think we can be like that too, right? We can, we can blame other people. Me and them, we have problems, and it's just because of them. There's usually some embellishment. It's kind of the same exact process. Well, James... We know that this is a rhetorical question because James answers the question himself. He says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. James turns it around on him, doesn't he? He says, you're the problem. You're having all these conflicts with everybody, and guess what? Look in the mirror if you want to, to find the culprit. Essentially, he's saying you're too worried about you. That's why you're having these problems. It's your passion. It's your desires that are causing all of these issues. And, you know, it's so easy to get in that what about me mindset and kind of filter everything through, okay, well, what am I going to get out of this? I think that's the exact position that James' audience is in. You know, he even says that you are, you're willing to murder and covet, right? Things that we would always say, hey, that's not something you should do. He says, hey, you guys are at that point. And I don't think that, that they were literally murdering one another. But, you know, they had gotten to the point where what they, they wanted what they wanted so bad that they're, it's like their brethren are dead to them, right? They're, they are inconsequential as far as getting, getting what they want goes. And so he says, as long as you are your primary concern, you guys are going to have these issues. You guys are going to continue to have these conflicts. 
And so James actually reminds them of a, of a very, very important passage in James chapter 4 and verse 6, uh, where he says, he gives greater grace. And therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so all through time, we can see that God has actually stood up against the proud. Every time there's somebody who is too prideful, God stands against them. And it's the humble people, the people who are lowly in spirit. Those are the people that God gravitates towards. Those are the people that God actually lifts back up. I actually use this example at camp, but I, I always think about how God treats Nebuchadnezzar versus how he treats Moses. Right? You have Nebuchadnezzar, he's this king, and he's, he's very powerful, and he starts to get a little bit full of himself. He actually puts himself against God, and God takes him down. He turns him into a beast. But then you think about how God interacts with Moses, who makes mistakes, right? I think we can all understand that Moses was not a flawless man. God's constantly bringing him up. He's lifting him up, and it's because he is, he is humble. You know, really, the main difference between Moses and Nebuchadnezzar is Moses is humble, and Nebuchadnezzar is not. And so he brings this up to show them, hey, you guys are having these problems, and what you really need is, the, is a dose of humility. You need a dose of humbleness. And so that's what we need as churches. Humility is uh, it's not being too puffed up, right? Think about people who might, who might brag or boast, people who are really always trying to call attention to themselves. That's the opposite of humility. The Pharisees, when Jesus comes, are a very, very good example of this. Uh, they're going around, they're performing their deeds so that they can be seen of others. Uh, you have that situation where there's that Pharisee, he's praying and he prays loudly and he prays long and he's comparing himself to this, this tax collector that's right next to him. That is not what humility looks like. And so really, we need to have this appropriate view of ourselves. That's what James is trying to get them to understand. You need to have an appropriate view of yourself. Don't, don't puff yourself up too, too much. These are the people who God gives grace to. It's the people who are humble, who show humility. Um, another component of humility is that we are people who put others first. You know, there's a, a few places in Scripture, one of which we're actually going to look at later, um, where you see humility and selfishness used in contrast to one another. One way to show humility is really just to consider somebody else. Consider somebody else's perspective. Consider their point of view. Consider their needs, their wants, all, all of that. These are the kinds of things that James wants his audience to, to take on. These are the kinds of people that James wants his audience to become. And so James, he says, okay, look, you're having all of these problems. There's all of these conflicts, and you're having them because you are not humble. You need to take a good look in the mirror and, and check your pride. If you want these conflicts to go away, then some humility is in order. But if you look at a couple other passages with me here in, uh, in James chapter 4, there's, there's all of these other problems that are coming from their lack of pride as well. Um, if you look later on in verses 3 and 4 of James chapter 4, James says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So it seems like because of this pride problem, uh, James' audience, their, their prayer lives are all out of whack as well, right? It's weird how pride can touch all of these different areas of our lives. Because they are prideful, their prayers end up looking kind of, kind of weird. In some cases, it sounds, like, it sounds like they're not even asking God, right? They have some needs and I guess they think that they can handle it themselves, and so they don't even think that they need God, right? Just think about how prideful you can be to say, hey, I don't need God. I can, I can handle this all on my own. There's other situations, though, where they are asking, but guess what? They don't get because they're asking with improper motives. They're asking these, these me, me, me prayers, right? They're praying for selfish reasons, for, for personal gain. You know, the desired end result of all of their prayers is, hey, what can I get out of this? God, can you give me something? They're not thinking of, of the people around them, and, and God doesn't respect that. They are prideful, and so their prayer lives actually are not full. Another thing that we can notice here in James chapter 4 is because they're prideful, they end up complaining about others. Drop down a couple of verses with me to uh, verses 11, 11 and 12. James says, don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who defames or judges a fellow believer defames and judges the law. If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? And so the people that James is talking to here, they're overly critical. 
right? They're looking around at everything else that, uh, what everybody else is doing. They're saying, oh yeah, that's, that's not the way that that should be. You know, sometimes, sometimes when we get prideful, um, we have our own standard of how other people should live, right? Maybe, maybe that's what I'm accustomed to, or maybe that's just what I think is the way that this thing should, uh, how someone should be living. And so we have what we think, our own standard, and we compare people to that. Well, that's pride, right? Isn't that pride? If, if I take my standard and I say, hey, this is what everybody else needs to be living to, I have said, man, I've got all the answers. I've got it, I've got it all right. But who's the judge? You know, James, James reminds them, he says, look, you're not the judge, you're not the lawgiver. We all serve the lawgiver. God is the lawgiver. So any, any kind of comparison that should happen should be compared to him. But sometimes people do struggle with things that actually are not in line with God's standard, right? Sometimes we have taken our standard out the way, and there's, there's some growth. There's some growth that needs to happen with somebody else. And sometimes we're not patient with them, right? Sometimes there's, somebody's working on something, and we're overly critical towards them, and we don't give them the time and the space to grow. That's pride. Because guess what? I needed a lot of time to grow. And I'm sure everybody here would say, hey, we all want as much time as we can. God has been incredibly patient with each and every person in here. And so we should do nothing else but show that patience to somebody else. Right? And these people here, they actually have the audacity to broadcast these criticisms to other people. Right? So it's bad enough that they're thinking these things, that they are criticizing these other people in their hearts, and they're, they're looking around and just kind of nitpicking at the people around them but they're going around and they're telling other people, man, can you believe what so-and-so did? Hmm, they ought to know better. But you, you know how they are, right? Those are, those are things that we might say. And really what we're doing when we're saying those things is, is we're bringing somebody else down and we're slightly lifting ourselves up, right? Because the things that we notice in them, we're making a big deal about them. We're telling everybody and they're just going lower and lower and lower, but there are things that we're struggling with and we're not as vocal about those, right? And so really what's going on here, just like James says, is, is we're defaming them. We're bringing them down to boost ourselves up. And he says that's pride. You know, it's one thing to be working with someone and, you know, you're trying to help them get to where they need to be. That's what love looks like. But if we're ever in a situation where we're constantly finding fault with everybody else around us, then I think we need to check our pride. These people here, they're so prideful that it sounds like they're not even thinking about God in their day-to-day -day lives. Drop down a couple of verses, uh, verses 13 through 16. James says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring or what your life will be. For you are like a vapor that appears for a little while then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. And so this pride thing has festered so much in the group that James is talking to that they've actually gotten to this point where they say that they don't even, they don't even need God, right? They're making all of these plans, and at no point are, there, are they stepping back to say, man, is this something that God approves of? Is this something that God would want me to do? You know, I've got a guy back home who he pretty much always says, if you'll say, hey, see you later, he'll always say, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. And I will say... I probably made fun of him the first couple times I, I heard him say that. But as I was prepping for this lesson, I thought about it. I was like, man, I probably do need to say that more. I probably do need to consider, man, is this the Lord's will? Is it the Lord's will that I do this thing or, or do that thing? Because it seems like these people here in James chapter 4 are, are not considering that. And he says, hey, these things ought not to be this way. You know, who am I to think that I can just do it alone? Right? Who am I to think that I don't need to check with God or, or make sure that God is on board with whatever it is that I'm doing? If I've gotten to that point, then that's pride. That's boasting. That's arrogance, like he says here in James chapter 4. And so I think we can say, because of, because of all these things that we just read, that a healthy church consists of, of humble Christians. Right? People who are willing to lower themselves. Because we understand the dangers that living a prideful life can bring to us. Right, there's some negatives for us, right? I don't think that, that I can live my best life when I am being proud, prideful, when I'm boasting about myself. But man, there's a ton of damage that can happen to the body as well. There's a ton of damage that can happen to the brothers and sisters in Christ around me. You know, we all acknowledged uh, on Sunday, in fact, if you remember, everybody had their hand up. We all want to be a part of a healthy church. 
Well, when we stop living for self, when we start humbling ourselves, when we start serving our brethren, then we kind of start speeding towards that goal. Because this right here, when we, when we are a healthy church and when we consist of, of humble Christians, there's so many good things that are, that are available for our congregations. Number one, when this is true of our congregations, then conflict in a congregation is reduced. Right? That's the problem with, with James' group here, right? They're having these conflicts. He says, hey, if you just add some humbleness, add some humility, then these problems would go away. These may be some made-up statistics, but I'm going to give them to you anyway. I think that about 50% of the problems that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ are because we're too focused on getting what we want. You know, I had an idea, and somebody else didn't like it, and so now, therefore, I don't like that person. Or I had this idea, and somebody else thought that there was another way to go, and so now we have problems, right? You see how there's way too much I there. There's way too much of a focus on myself, right? So that's about 50% of problems. So if we could just do that, then that's 50%. I think another maybe 20% of our problems are, are made worse because of pride, right? So maybe somebody actually did do something to us, but we really held on to it, right? We didn't want to forgive them. That's... That's what pride looks like. Because if I was humble, I would remember how much God has forgiven me, right? And then I would extend that forgiveness to somebody else. I think about that, uh, that parable of the, the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18, where you have a guy who was forgiven just this, this amazing amount of debt, right? And then he turns to his ser- to, a, to another servant who owes him just maybe something, something serious, but way less than he was forgiven, and he's holding that against him, right? When I can't remember how much I've been forgiven and I hold things against other people, then that's that's pride. And so that's another 20% of of problems. If we could just if we could just do away with that, then now that's already 70% of our problems gone. Man, I think another 20% of our problems, so now we're already up to 90, right? Another 20% of our problems come because we're overly critical. Right? There's that phrase to a hammer, everything's a nail. Right? When we're looking for fault in others, when we are trying to be overly critical when we're not looking at ourselves enough and and finding our own faults and getting rid of those, we're going to find it in others, right? When I'm really trying to find something wrong, I'm going to find it. And so I did leave 10% because there are situations, right, where there really is a a need for conflict, right, where there's somebody who is not holding to the truth and there are real issues that need to be dealt with. But man, if we are always having problems with the people around us, I think we would do good to check our pride and make sure that we are showing some humility. If we can get this right, then the conflict in our congregations will be reduced. Um, Another benefit from from humility is I think we can actually avoid sin. Uh, Read verse 7 with me in in James chapter 4. In James chapter 4 and verse 7, James says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so number one, pride will, will keep you from submitting to God. Right? Anything that we do that is not in submission to God is automatically sin. Well, if if I am always focused on myself and what I think is best for me, if God comes in and says, hey, hey, that's not the way that you should do this, man, it's going to be really hard for me to change. It's going to be hard for me to submit. I need to get rid of that pride first. Um, pride will also keep you from resisting the devil, right? Because what pride does is it gives you this overinflated sense of ability, right? If I'm being prideful, I think I could just do any and everything, right? And so pride will have you look and sin in the face and saying, I got this. Yeah, I can, I can be in this situation. I know there's temptation, but yeah, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll handle that. I'll be okay. No, we need to resist the devil. We need to flee from the devil. When we show humility, we are able to recognize our weaknesses. We are able to recognize things that will provide temptation for us, and we can remove ourselves from those situations because we're not prideful. And I think that helps us be the best examples that we can for the people around us. I think about Think about maybe some of the younger Christians or the younger people who may see us in these, in these difficult situations and then they grow up and they're like, oh yeah, I can do that. Well, so-and-so did it. It's like, no, man, we need to stay away from these uh, temptations. And so when we are humble, when we show humility, we can actually avoid sin. We can cling to God and we can uh, run away from the devil. But also when we're humble, James says that God blesses us, right? Each and every one of us. Our prayers can be answered when we are praying the right way. And can you imagine a church of 150 people where everyone is having their prayers answered because everyone is praying for the right things and they are 
praying in the right ways with the right motivations, right? Imagine a church where God is just constantly blessing everybody there, right? That's what happens when we are a church that consists of, uh, of humble members. You know, God even specifically lifts up the humble. If you'll read verse 10, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you, right? So when we are humble, when we bring ourselves low, God is there and he's ready to, to lift us up. I kind of think about all of us as like we're little balloons, right? That need to, we need to be inflated, right? We want to be filled up. Um, but when we try to do it on our own, what we end up doing is we overinflate ourselves, right? We just keep pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping. And what happens when you put too much air into a balloon? It pops, right? Or at the very least, it starts rubbing up against the other balloons that are there in a way that, that's, not, that's not good, right? But God doesn't do that. He knows exactly how much I need, right? He doesn't overinflate me. He knows exactly what I need. And moving forward, uh, you know, if we, if we are humble people, then all of our plans are going to be plans that are in line with God's plans, right? Not because of some, like, mysterious thing, right? I don't think it's because, oh, I'm humble, so then God automatically gives me every single thing that I want. But if I'm truly humble, if, if I show humility, then I'm going to try to line my, my will up with God's. Anything that I want is going to be what God wants. And if something happens that maybe wasn't directly in my will, but I know it's in God's will, well, that's okay with me because it's not all about me. It's all about God, right? If we have humbled ourselves to the point where whatever God wills is really true of us, that's how we get to this point here. And so a healthy church consists of humble Christians. And I was, I was trying to think of some, uh, some, some key ways that we can live this out in real life. And unfortunately, I don't think there's a magic bullet. I don't think there's a magic bullet that can get us to the point where there is no pride in us and where we're always showing humility. If you think about 1 John chapter 3, uh, John there says that the pride of life is at the core of just about every sin, right? You think back to early in the beginning, man had it good, but Man wanted to be like God, right? And so Adam and Eve, they take the fruit, right? That's pride that's there. And so this is a battle that we have been fighting for a long, long time. We've been fighting this, this war against pride since the very beginning. And unfortunately now, I think the world is, is trying its hardest to get us to be prideful people. And if you think back to, to chapter 1, think back to chapter 1 and verse 27, which was uh, our first verse, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Man, guys, I think pride is the number one way that we can be stained by the world because the world is going to tell us, hey, look, you got to pump yourself up. Hey, look, life is all about you. You got to make sure that you're good. That's what the world will tell you today. And we've got to try our hardest to to fight against that. Now, again, I wish I could give you just the one thing to, to nix all of it, but I do have a, a couple a couple points that I think will be helpful. Number one, we can become, uh, come, become humble people by A, drawing near to God. Read verse eight with me of James chapter four. James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And so when you draw near to God, and we're going to talk about how exactly to do that in a moment, but when you draw near to God, I think you can't help but be humbled, right? When you think about all of the, the greatness of God, when you think about all the things that he can do, when you think about just his holiness, right, you just realize, man, I, I don't measure up, right? When I compare myself to God, I'm always brought low, I think about Isaiah when he sees God for the first time. Now, Isaiah, he's a, he's a good man. He's going to end up being a prophet for the Lord. And he meets God, and he's like, man, a wretched man am I. He's like, I'm terrible. I'm the, I'm the worst of the worst. Because when you draw near to God, when you have a real understanding of him, humility is just the natural byproduct of that. And so when we are constantly learning about him, when we are constantly learning about the things that he's done, there is a natural humbling that comes from that. And so we need to draw near to God. We need to, A, make sure that we're reading, right? We need to be reading God's word. Um, as I'm going through, through the Bible, I constantly come, come across things that God has done, and I'm just like, wow, isn't our God amazing? Or he'll handle a situation. I'm like, man, there's no way I would handle that that way. I would have gotten angry, and who knows? I would have blown up the whole world. And I'm just, I'm just in awe of how awesome he really is, and that naturally just brings me low. I think we need to be praying more as well, especially if we notice that we're having a problem with pride or uh, having a problem with humility. 
We need to be taking those things to the Father. We need to be confessing our sins to God, right? If I'm constantly going to God and taking my sins to him, don't you think that that's going to humble me as I'm having to vocalize, hey, these are some things that I'm struggling with, right? And so we have to be reading. We have to be praying. The closer we get to him, the more humility we will show. And the other way we can do this is simply just to put others first. Back over in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, it's actually verses 3 through 11, um, but we're only going to read verses 3 and 4. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So if we want to be humble Christians, and we're really going to have to live this out. If this is going to be true of me and, you know, true of the people that I worship with, then I'm going to have to root out selfishness. I'm going to have to make sure that I don't do anything out of selfish conceit. You know, I'm going to have to actually think about others as more important than myself. Right? And I don't know if you've ever tried to do an exercise around that. It's hard to really think about other people as more important than me. But that means, it means when a situation arises and somebody else gets something and maybe I don't, well, that's okay, right? Because this person is more important than I am. When I have a desire or when, when I want to do something, I need to be looking out for everybody around me. We have to put others first. And of course, he uses Jesus as the example here in, in Philippians chapter 2. He says he left heaven and he came down to earth, right? And even if we just left it at that, what an awesome form of humility that would have been. Because Jesus was in heaven. He was at He's at the right hand of God, and he came down. He took a step down just to come here and be a human. So even if we just left it there, that would be amazing humility. But, of course, Jesus, he goes farther than that, right? He dies for all of us. And at no point in Jesus' journey is he thinking about himself, right? He is the perfect example of humility. If Jesus was thinking about himself, then at some point he would have put a stop to everything that was going on because Jesus doesn't really get anything out of dying for, for you and I, right? But he looks past that. And so we've got to get to that point as well. There are acts of love and acts of service that we are obligated to do for one another where it's not going to do anything for us, right? But we've got to see it through the lens of what is this doing for this person over here. If we want our churches to be healthy, then it really just starts with a little bit of, of humility. And the, the really cool thing about humility is that I, I think it's kind of contagious. It's a, a, little bit, a little bit infectious maybe. You know, when you have a culture of humility in a group where everybody is putting others first, generally newcomers will reciprocate, right? If I put somebody else first, now they're more likely to put me first, right? Of course, that doesn't always happen. You run into situations where people take advantage, but even, even when they don't reciprocate, God sees what's going on, right? He sees the humility that I'm showing, and what does he do? He lifts us up. He gives grace to those who are humble. And so healthy churches are churches who have members who will show humility, members who are humble. And so here's a list of the things that we've talked about this week. Um, these are kind of the components of a healthy church. It's care for the needy. It's love without partiality. It's careful communication, and it's humble service. And I think this is pretty simple stuff, right? This is, this is pretty, this is not, not groundbreaking stuff. These are things that we can literally all work on, like, today, like, as soon, as soon as we say the final amen, we can work on, on one or even all of these things. You know, what I've noticed on a, on a personal level and also from a congregational level is it's the simple stuff that we struggle with a lot, right? Some of the more complicated things, somehow we, we find a way to figure those things out. But it's like, it's the core things. It's the, the foundational things. Well, all of the other things that we need to do as a, as a church, as a congregation, they have to be built on these foundational things, uh, let me just give you one example over in James chapter 5. James chapter 5, if you notice, we actually didn't touch too much in James chapter 5, but there's um, a ton of good stuff here as well. But in James chapter 5, the last two verses, verses 19 and 20, uh, James kind of tells really the, the core of what churches are supposed to do for one another. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, James says, My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from, from death and cover a multitude of sins. 
And so James says, hey, look, like you got to be looking out for your brothers and sisters, right? You've got to make sure that, you're, that it, we're all on this road towards heaven. Make sure that nobody's falling down. Make sure that we're picking people up when they're down. Can you imagine trying to save somebody's soul from death without these things here? If you're trying to turn a sinner from the error of his ways, but he can't detect that you would really be there for him if, if he was in need, you think he's listening? Because I, I don't think he's listening. If you're trying to save a sinner, but you don't even greet them because you're showing partiality, because there's something about them that, that doesn't really jive with you, do you think, do you think they want to hear anything that you have to say? Man, try saving somebody. Try rebuking someone, having one of these tough conversations without being careful in your communication. Try having that conversation while being prideful, right? All of the things that we are supposed to do for one another have to be built on this foundation right here. And so I think if we can do these things, if we can make an earnest effort to, to really understand and grasp and put these things into play, into practice, then our churches can't help but get healthier, and they can't help but get healthier and healthier. And so there may be somebody here tonight who has not been, been baptized. Um, we would love to help you with that in really whatever way that we can. You may be already at the point where you recognize, okay, I need to be baptized. I, I know what Jesus has done for me. I know that he died, that he was resurrected, and that um, if I want to be in line with him, I need to be baptized. I need to have my sins washed away. If you're at that point and you are ready for baptism, you can come down to the front. We can start that process for you. But you may be here tonight and you just have, you just have a ton of questions. Like, what is, what is all this about? We can help answer those questions as well. Um, in Matthew chapter 28, we have some of the last things that Jesus said. You know, he's kind of giving the disciples their final marching order, if you will. And part of this mission is, as disciples is to actually baptize people into Jesus, right? It's Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 28, verses, verses 18 to 20. Let me get here. I know I'm only 28, but my vision was tested here a couple of days ago. But it's Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so part of their mission is to baptize people, to immerse people in water, to put them into God's family, and, of course, there's some teaching that happens there as well because baptism isn't the end of your journey. Really, it's just kind of the, the very beginning. There's teaching that's going to happen from that point moving forward. But baptism is something that Jesus wants from all of his followers. Everybody who believes in him and who knows him and is willing to confess him, he wants those people to be baptized as well. And so if you have any needs at all, if you have any needs, come forward now as we sing our, our invitation song. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right?